In this video, we're going to explore how we can make a large piece of tabletop scenery that has several parts and many uses, from Warhammer to Mordheim, as well as Dungeons and Dragons. All the parts of this piece of terrain are stored in a compact area on my bookshelf, but they take up a large section of the table when deployed. Fitting the gothic architecture of both medieval fantasy and the far future of the 40k universe, this piece of terrain was inspired by the types of structures that would appear attached to a monastic foundation. This idea that the priests of a religious order would isolate themselves from the outside world has had a lot of resonance with me in the past couple of months, and I thought this structure would pose a fun challenge. I started with a ton of reference images, and my search history probably looks pretty strange in the last week. Since a cloister is usually attached to a large cathedral, I wanted to get the scale right. I'm using the floor plans from the Salisbury Cathedral in England as my starting point, and I've translated the major shapes into a scale close to 28mm. I'm not trying to match the scale exactly, but I wanted to fit this on a 4x6 table comfortably, so I took some artistic liberties. You may be asking, Narb, why are you mocking up the whole cathedral? I thought you were just making the cloister. Well, maybe I am, maybe I'm not but you probably want to subscribe in case I do a video making the rest of the cathedral later this month. The defining design element of Gothic architecture is the pointed arch. I wanted to get the essence of this across on the cloister ruins, so I knew I had to carve out lots of these arches to serve as windows, as well as form the vaulted ceiling on the aisle. I wanted the end structure to be sturdy enough to manhandle on a gaming board, and making this exclusively out of foam would have made it too fragile. Cut the bases out from MDF, easy enough on the table saw, but I was dreading cutting out over 100 arches of chipboard, which was my first consideration. There had to be a better way to take the tedium out of this. So let's throw technology at the problem. I grabbed my computer and loaded up SketchUp and began digitally recreating my mock-up. Adding lots of repeating arches is now 100% easier. Wait, but how do I get the shapes from inside my computer into the real world? 3D pr- No, too big. Let's cut it out on a CNC machine. Let me know if you want the plants of this stuff. The thickness of the plywood used is 3 16 of an inch, so the building will end up very sturdy. I also did end up 3D printing the window frames that would go into each slot, so the 3D printer got some use here as well for most of the detailed bits. The parts need to be cut out of these tabs as they come out, and some light sanding around the edges is needed to clean up. We'll be using some wood glue to assemble the center walls. I designed these slots on the sides so they can line up properly. The middle is one foot square, so this should fit around it perfectly. More on those dimensions later. I added some holes to the MDF base to give the hot glue some extra texture to adhere to. Well, that looks like a real building now. However, sacrifices must be made for modularity, and the best way to achieve this is to cut the building into four pieces. Using a pair of tin snips, I'm able to make quick work of this plywood. Some mild damage is quickly repaired with more hot glue. I could have just cut nice clean lines across the corners, but these are going to be ruins, so leaning into the damage a ruined building would display plays to our strengths here. Just because I didn't cut out hundreds of arches doesn't mean I didn't want to do anything tedious with the build. I opted to choose the smallest brick size possible to inflict as much suffering, I mean, I mean fun, to this build. Using a hot wire table saved a ton of time here, and after tumbling the bricks with some sharp metal bits, they were ready to go onto the building. The bricks would serve as a way to add lots of detail to the walls and sell the illusion that this is a stone construction. I found the best way to stick these bricks on is PVA glue onto another solid surface. However, if you're a dummy and want to have freestanding walls like me, then PVA glue makes the whole structure too fiddly to stand as you're working on it. 
Using some low temperature hot glue makes it a lot easier to keep the wall standing, but it has the downside of having all these annoying strings and the really short working time. If I was doing this again, I would find some way to add a thin piece of paper or cardstock as a backing piece to anywhere I wanted a thin wall and then double layer the bricks on each side of it. Next up, to add a hint of a roof, I'm using a lot of inspiration from Eric's build on the Mordheim buildings linked above. You basically cut up some coffee stir sticks broken at various lengths to hint at the previous roof framing, and then you add in some shingles cut from recycled cereal box. I was very mindful to keep the whole interior of the aisles playable, so a lot of the roof or sides of the structures are missing to facilitate giant hands coming in from the sky and moving around all the tiny people inside. I uh, sort of forgot to add any sort of pattern or detail to the floor, so we're going to fix that in post-production. Adding some plaster and toilet paper, we can make this poor man's sculpt mold and build up some of the corners where rubble would have fallen. Then taking some hardened plaster and breaking it into pieces, we can add realistic looking chunks of stone that may have fallen off the building. I base coat all the wood and foam in an oil-based primer. This works really well at sealing all the pores of the wood to have a nice, even surface for our paint to stick to. I wanted to go for a burnt, dark look, so I base coated the whole thing in a black spray paint as my base coat, and then I came in with various tones of red, brown, and orange on some of the bricks to give them some natural tones and variation. This type of paint scheme is very common when working on medieval buildings with stonework. All the wood on the roof got a coat of brown, and all the shingles got painted in blue. The ground cover got some splotches of brown, and I added some sand and PVA to the mix to add some more texture. Make sure to blend the sand around to make various areas of different densities. To lighten the whole piece up, I then overbrushed and dry brushed a light tan over the entire surface. You want to go heavier in spots where lots of sun would reach, like the tops of the bricks, walls, and places where sun would shine through the holes in the roof. Once that all dried, I came in with a dark wash to blend everything together and add lots of contrast in all the recesses. While I was building the cloister walls, I also worked on the inner part of the courtyard, as there was a lot of drying time involved. As I mentioned before, the middle of the cloister is a one foot square. I chose to use a vinyl tile since it's exactly one foot square. The vinyl tile comes with this adhesive backing, so I just added some plaster to this side to give some variation in terrain. For the paver stones, I cut out some squares from EVA craft foam and added some cuts to simulate cracks. Hitting these with a heat gun later would accentuate them a bit more. To get some dirt and ground texture, I added a mix of gravel, fine sand, and coconut fibers. You can buy this from pet stores in the lizard section. I had a layer of dried tile grout at the bottom of a cup from a previous project, and this added some awesome cracked stone rubble around the 3D printed fountain here in the middle. The whole piece got a generous coating of watered down PVA glue and some brown and gray paint to seal all the dirt texture in. Once it was all dry, it was time to add the flocking. I think the secret to good flocking comes from having lots of variety. The general process is adding some PVA glue where you want the flock to go down. I use a brush for this and then you sprinkle it from above. I started with the dark green grass and then a winter dried grass after and then working up progressively lighter towards the middle. Pro tip, you can collect the parts that don't stick and add them back to your pouch if you put a large sheet of paper underneath. Once I had the grass gradient in, I went to a different kind of flocking. This one's labeled clump foliage with some similar color gradients. 
Adding watered down PVA glue on top of the previous layer works quite well. Once you're happy with the results, add another layer of watered down PVA glue just to get everything to stick down from above as well. The benefit of using the vinyl tile here instead of an MDF base is that it won't start growing mold from all the water we use in the process. Patience is key here. After everything's dried, I gave it some extra coats of matte varnish to really make sure that this piece can be played with. If this is a terrain piece and it's going to be touched by a lot of hands, the flocking can come off, so I wanted to prevent that. I gave mine three coats and it's hard as a rock now. I really hope you've enjoyed this awesome build and I want to thank all my awesome patrons for keeping my supplies going for this and other builds. See you in the next one.